Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now in the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We began a lesson this morning entitled, God's Eternal Purpose. My friends, that is exactly what the Apostle Paul is speaking about in Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. In our lesson this morning, we looked at four different points with regard to this eternal purpose. We noted, first of all, that this eternal purpose is something which must be preached. Individuals must be made to see God's eternal purpose. The second point that we noted is that God's eternal purpose is a treasure. In fact, it is a part of the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we noted that God's eternal purpose involves a fellowship. It involves joint participation, a communion, intercourse between not only man and God, but also between man and man. Lastly, we noted that this eternal purpose began as a mystery. That is, as a mystery to mankind. God had it in His mind. He had it planned and intended. And yet man could not at one point in time comprehend it. He was unable to see it. But we noted also that now this mystery has been manifested to all humanity. Tonight we want to continue that particular study And there's four more points that we want to talk about for the next few moments. The very first point is probably the most vital of all the points. And it is this. God's eternal purpose is the church. Notice if you will beginning at verse 10. To the intent that now under principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Folks, God's eternal purpose is the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God had it in His mind. God intended it. God willed it. And eventually that church was brought to pass in Acts the second chapter. It was brought to pass on Pentecost Day after our Lord's resurrection and ascension back to the right hand of God. What is the church? We can define it in two ways. We can define just the word itself. In the Greek language, the word is ekklesia. E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. That is really a combination of two terms. Ek, meaning out of, and klesia, meaning to call. In other words, the church is composed of all of the called out ones. We'll come back to that point in our conclusion of this lesson. The called out. Brother Guy N. Woods had a wonderful definition of the church. And that definition goes like this. The church is... The body of baptized believers called out of the world over which Christ reigns as head and in whom the Spirit of God dwells. That's a pretty long definition, isn't it? Some of you look like you're trying to write. Let's repeat that definition. The definition of the church as given by Brother Woods is this. The body of baptized believers Called out of the world. Remember, that's the definition of the term church, the called out ones. Called out of the world, over which Christ reigns as head, and in whom the Spirit of God dwells. My friends, the church is God's eternal purpose. And yet today in our society, we find individuals who degrade the church. Individuals who mock the church. Individuals who act as if the church is not important at all. 
In fact, there are individuals who will make that very statement, will they not? The church is not important. It doesn't matter what church you attend. Just attend the church of your choice. The church doesn't save you. On and on and on the statements go. Of those individuals in the denominational world who do not have a clue, who do not have a clue about the Lord's church, folks. The church is the eternal purpose of the Almighty God. And it is not something to be laughed at. It is not something to be scoffed at and mocked at. The reason these individuals don't understand the church is because they have no clue about the close link that resides between our Savior Jesus Christ and His precious church, my friends. Some individuals will make this statement. Jesus Christ is important, but the church is not important. Some individuals will say, give us Jesus, not the church. In days gone by when individuals would debate, when individuals would really try to stand up for their religion, oftentimes this statement was made. Give us the man, not the plan. Folks, you see, they don't understand the relationship that exists between Jesus and His church. Let's talk about that relationship very briefly. One of the close things about Jesus and His church is this. Jesus promised to build His church. Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. Folks, those words sound like to me that Jesus had an intent upon building something, doesn't it to you? I will build my church. Not I hope to build my church. I want to build my church. I think I might build my church. Oh no, upon this rock I will build my church, he says. My friends, he shed his precious blood in order to purchase the church of Christ, did he not? Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. Acts 20, 28. If the death of Jesus is important, then the church of Jesus is important. It took the shedding of His blood in order for the church to be brought into existence. Folks, however valuable the blood of Jesus is, is exactly how valuable the precious church of Christ is today. And yet people fail to understand that. Individuals say, there's no salvation in the church. They haven't read Ephesians 5, 23, have they? For He is the head of the body, the church, and the Savior of the body, as well, the text says. Folks, He is the Savior of the church. Jesus died, shed His blood in order to purchase what? In order to purchase the church. In order to save the church. The Bible says He's the head of the church. Colossians 1 verse 18. The Bible says that the church is the precious bride of Christ. Ephesians 5, 23 through 32. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. When our Lord comes again, we talked about it in Bible class this morning. Guess who He's going to be looking for? He isn't going to be looking for just anybody. Did you know that? He's going to be looking for one body and one body only. He will be looking for His church, folks. According to Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. You see, there's a close relationship between Jesus and the church. And individuals fail to get it. They fail to understand it. And because of that, they belittle that divine institution, that eternal purpose of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Point number two tonight. The church of Christ manifests the manifold wisdom of of God. 
Notice what he says, to the intent that now in the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, listen to him, the manifold wisdom of God. Folks, when you and I look at the church of Christ, you and I ought to be astounded at the wisdom of the Almighty God. Notice that he doesn't just say it is a part of the wisdom of God. He says that it is evidence of the manifold wisdom of God. There is not a human being upon the face of this earth who could have thought up the church. Couldn't do that. Folks, you and I could have got our heads together for millions and millions and millions of years and we would have never thought of the church. That, my friends, is a product of the divine mind of the Almighty God. I want you to stop for just a minute and I want you to really think about what the church is and what it does and how it serves us. First, the church is the kingdom of God. Colossians 1 verse 13, Matthew 16 verse 18, and many other passages of Scripture. The church is the kingdom. Now think about that. Are there a lot of kingdoms on earth today? Oh, absolutely. The United States is a kingdom. Great Britain is a kingdom. Japan has a kingdom. There's a kingdom in Iraq, Iran. There's kingdoms all over the place, are there not? And in the midst of all of these earthly kingdoms, guess what God did? God put His kingdom right in the midst of them, did He not? But listen to what He says. My kingdom is not of this world. John 18, verse 36. There is not a kingdom that is like the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Folks, it's not a political kingdom. It is not a worldly, carnal, earthly kingdom. It is not a kingdom that is concerned about what it possesses and how much land it has. It's not a military kingdom. And yet this kingdom has been in existence for two thousand years upon the face of this earth. Kingdoms of men have come and they have gone and the kingdom of Jesus Christ stands today. And folks, if this world lasts another million years, guess what? The church, the kingdom of God will stay right here on this planet. It will never, ever Go away. It will never be destroyed. And it doesn't matter how much men rail against it and how much they try to persecute it and destroy it, you cannot do away with it. If you don't believe that, die, go to heaven and talk to Paul. Because folks, there was a time in his history that that was his main desire to rid the earth of the church. And he could not do it. It's an impossibility. Who thought of such a kingdom? Who would have made such a kingdom on earth today? Oh, today we hear a lot of talk about a kingdom of God, a kingdom of God, a kingdom of God, don't we? It's coming, it's soon, it's going to be a thousand year kingdom. Guess what kind of kingdom men think about? An earthly, temporal, physical kingdom, don't they? It's going to be located right over there in Jerusalem. It's going to overthrow every other kingdom and Jesus is going to reign and rule over all the nations of the earth. We always think physical, folks. God thinks spiritually. Secondly, the church is referred to over and over in the pages of God's Word as the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Ephesians 4, verse 4. Colossians 1 verse 18. Folks, the Bible says that the church is a body. 
When you and I become members of the church, guess what God does? God sets us in the body of Christ. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleaseth Him. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 18. The moment you become a Christian, God takes you and He puts you into the body of Christ. Folks, it is a living organism. This building is not the body, the church of Christ. We are the church. Human beings are the church. And every one of us, just like our physical body, has a role to play in the body of Christ. God created you. God designed you. God fabricated you. God brought you into being. God knows everything there is to know about you. And when you become a member of His body, He puts you right where He wants you to be. You might be a kidney. You might be a heart. You might be an eye, you might be a mouth, you might be an ear, you might be a foot, you might be just a little toe. But God knows everything there is to know and He puts you in the body where you can perform and where you can function and where you can edify and build up the precious body of Christ. Who could think of such a thing? Who could think of that? A body. Did you know that our Lord has an army upon this earth? Well, Vic, you just denied now what you said a while ago. A while ago you said the kingdom has no army, no physical army, no fighting army from the standpoint of physical weapons, folks. But our Lord has an army, does He not? When you and I say, yes, I want to become a Christian, guess what we do? We say, I want to sign up for the army of God. There's a battle going on in this world. There's a fight against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. And you and I become Christians. We become members of the army of the Almighty God. And folks, it is up to us to fight and to stand and to fight against the forces of evil. And if we don't, who will? Who will? Who could think of such an army? When men think of armies, they think of blood. They think of guns, don't they? They think of captains and generals. They think of power. Who would have thought to put an army on earth to fight the spiritual forces of evil that dwell in this world. You know, in our society today, there's a lot of individuals who are born into some pretty bad families, are they not? There's children who are born into families where there is no father. There are children who are born into families where the mother could care less. There are children who are born into this world who are immediately given up for adoption, aren't they? There are children who live in families who suffer all kinds of affliction. Physical, verbal, mental, emotional abuse of all kinds. And those individuals could become very bitter and some of them have against the concept of family, couldn't they? But folks, family is a good thing when it is carried out the way God has designed it. When there is a father and a mother and they love one another and they love their children and they are righteous and holy and they try to labor for the Almighty God in His kingdom, folks, that is a wonderful thing for children to grow up in. But not all have that. But guess what God has done? God has said, my church is a family. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. Folks, we have a family that we can belong to. We have a family that has a father who loves us and cares for us and provides for our every need. We have a family, brothers and sisters, who are willing to support us, who are willing to aid us, who are willing to comfort us. 
We have a family that is there to discipline us when needed. We have a family that's there to hold us accountable to the Word of the living God, folks. Who would have thought of that concept? We live in a dark world, don't we? You go outside these doors, and folks, it doesn't take you very long to see sin, does it? It doesn't take you very long to know that there is violence out there. That there's all kinds of carnality. And yet God's people live right in the middle of that kind of a world, don't we? But yet God has said this, I'm going to give you a place to live, to function, where you don't have to be involved in any of that junk in the world. In fact, He tells us, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, verse 2. He tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 1 John 2, verse 15. Folks, He's given us a body, a place, a fellowship, a church where you and I can live and function in holiness and in godliness and in righteousness even though we are right in the middle of the world. Who could think of such things. And folks, we've only touched the hem of the garment relative to the precious church of our Lord. It's a vineyard. It's a temple. And on and on the concepts go with regard to the church. You see, when you look at the church, it's not something to be laughed at. It's not something to be despised. The church is something that you and I should stand in awe of, should we not? Wow! The church manifesting the manifold wisdom of an almighty God. Unbelievable is the word, folks. Unbelievable. Point number three. As we've been emphasizing throughout the entirety of this particular lesson... The eternal purpose of God is just that. It is eternal. According to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church is eternal, folks. The church has always, always existed in the mind of God. There has never been a time when the church did not exist in some form. Before God laid the foundations of this earth, guess what? He had the church in His mind. It's always been there. That thought for a lot of people It's hard to comprehend, isn't it? Because you see, they don't have that view of the church. In our studies on Thursday nights, we've been talking about premillennialism. And folks, if there were ever a theory that degrades and that belittles the church of our Lord and Savior, it is the theory of premillennialism. And it stinks in the nostrils of God. Let me rehearse it very quickly for you again. The premillennialists say this. Jesus came to establish an earthly kingdom. They say that everything in the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament has to do with that kingdom that Jesus was supposed to come and establish. He leaves the heavenly portals, He comes to this earth, and He lives among men, does He not? Now remember, his intent all along is to establish what? An earthly kingdom. But he gets to the conclusion of his ministry and guess what? He can't do it. What? He can't do it. You mean to tell me Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth to establish a kingdom and He couldn't do it? Nope, couldn't do it. 
You mean the Almighty One, the All-Powerful One, the All-Wise One? Couldn't establish His kingdom? Nope, couldn't do it. There's only one question I got. You ready? Why? Why couldn't He establish His kingdom? You ready for this? The Jews. Are you kidding me? The Jews? You mean to tell me the Jews had enough power to stop Jesus from establishing His earthly kingdom? Folks, that is unfathomable. Did you know that? Who in their right mind would think such? Who in their right mind would have even enough courage to say that? Humanity stopped the Almighty God from establishing His kingdom. Yep, that's what they say. So Jesus sent it back to the right hand of the throne of God and guess what He did? He instituted a temporary expedient in His plan. Something He'd never thought of before. Can you imagine that? God just wasn't ready for this event. Well, I just knew they'd accept Him. Never thought they'd reject Him. So guess what He had to do? He had to come up with an alternative plan. And guess what that was, according to the premillennialist? The church. We're living in what they call the church age. A temporary expedient in the plan of God. Until such time, Jesus can return to this earth and establish the kingdom that He was supposed to establish the first time. Are you kidding me? Think about that, folks. What they're saying is this. The same Jews that rejected Him the first time are going to accept Him the second time. Are they sure? And if those Jews had the power to stop him the first time, will they have the power to stop him the second time? How do they know? Maybe he has to come up with temporary expedient number two. Whatever that might be. Folks, it's ridiculous. The church is not a temporary expedient in the plan of God. The church has always been in the mind of God. The church is the eternal purpose of the Almighty God. And God knew that His Son would come to this earth. He knew that His Son would be rejected. He knew that His Son would shed His precious blood on the cross of Calvary. He knew that the church would be established. And He knew salvation would be found in that body. There's nothing He didn't know about the church of Christ. It's always existed. You can go into the pages of the Old Testament and guess what? You find glimpses of the church over and over and over again, don't you? Folks, Noah's Ark. It's a type of the church. Where was salvation found? In the ark. Everybody outside the ark died and perished, did they not? And guess what? That ark was saved by water, wasn't it? Lifted that ark up. Saved those individuals that were in it. That water cleansed an evil world and set that ark back down, didn't it? You go just a little farther in history and you find God's children in Egyptian bondage, don't you? God sends a deliverer, Moses, delivers them out of an evil-handed ruler. They cross through the Red Sea, referred to as the baptism of Moses. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 and 2. And for the next 40 years, those individuals wander in the wilderness. Folks, you want to know who they are? They are a picture of the church. You know that? You go back and look at that picture, it's not always pretty, is it? Griping, complaining, arguing, fighting, sinning. That's us. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. That's us. You go a little bit farther in Egypt or in Israel's history, and all of a sudden God gives them the tabernacle, does he not? And the temple. Guess what? That's a pattern of the church. David comes along and establishes a wonderful kingdom after Saul. 
misuses that kingdom, doesn't he? And folks, that kingdom of David is a type of the church. The kingdom over which a king resides. You see, God had this church in his mind all along. All those kingdom prophecies that the premillennials say have absolutely nothing to do with the church have everything to do with the church. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Daniel 2.44 What kings? Roman kings, folks. When did the church get established? In the days of the Roman kings. God knew what he was doing. God had this church in his mind before the foundation of the world. The church is the eternal purpose of God. Notice that last point. Which he purposed in... Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the last point, folks. The church was purposed through Jesus. We've already talked about the relationship that exists between Christ and His church. Let's look at a couple of different things. When Jesus came to this earth, what did He say? Repent ye therefore and be converted, didn't He? For the kingdom is at hand. Matthew 4, verse 17. As he went across this, across all of uh, Palestine teaching, what did he teach about? The kingdom of heaven is likened to... And he spoke all of those parables, didn't he? To Peter and the apostles, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. He went to the garden of Gethsemane and there he poured out his soul unto the Almighty God. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It's interesting to me that we always point out the agony of Jesus with regard to the cross. And there was great agony, wasn't there? From a human standpoint, it was miserable. It was horrible to think that deity had to die for sinful man. And an individual who had never committed one sin was now going to bear the sins of all humanity. But there's another side of that coin. And the Bible says that there was joy that was set before Jesus in Romans 12, 1 through 3. Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Folks, He knew what He was doing, didn't He? I'm going to that cross, I'm going to shed my blood, and I'm going to purchase my precious bride, the church. And it was a joyful experience as far as deity was concerned. Jesus rose the third day. Some 40 days thereafter, He ascended back to the right hand of the throne of God. And according to Daniel 7, 13 and 14, He approached the ancient of days and guess what? There was given unto Him a kingdom. A domain. An everlasting domain. One that would never be destroyed, folks. What was that? That was the church. And on Pentecost Day, the Holy Spirit of God was sent by God The power came and the kingdom was established in A.D. 33. That was no accident. That was purposed by God before the beginning of time. And it was carried out through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, folks. Again, I'm amazed at the ignorance that revolves around the church of Christ. And what saddens me And I see it happening all the time. Our young people are growing up, getting to be 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, going off to college, and guess what? They have zero comprehension of the church. How can that be? Mom and daddies, you better start doing your job. I can't do it all up here. I can't preach on this every Sunday i got to preach the whole counsel of God. You better instill in your kid's mind that the church is the eternal purpose of the Almighty God. How sad it would be, would it not? To have known about it, to have been in it, to forsake it, and then find out on the last day that I missed it.
there's going to be a lot of people in that number, folks. How sad. The eternal purpose of God, the church. At one time a mystery, yes, but no longer. Now it's been revealed and now it needs to be preached, doesn't it? To all mankind. And folks, I've done my best today to preach about that church just a little bit. And We need to take a message like this to the world, do we not? And let them know that there is a place of salvation. And it manifests the wisdom of the Almighty God. Are you not a member of that body? Are you not a member of that army, that family? Not working and laboring in the vineyard? Folks, we want you to do that tonight. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, if you'll repent of sins, confess His precious name, and be immersed in water for the remission of sins, the Lord will add you to His church. Acts 2, 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 2, 47. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Don't miss the church, folks. It's God's eternal purpose. My friend, when individuals look at you as a member of that church, what do they see? Someone steadfast, someone unmovable, someone abounding in the work of the Lord, someone faithful, someone serving, someone doing everything they possibly can to build that body up. Maybe you've not been doing that and you need to repent. And you need to ask God to forgive you. You need to respond to this invitation once you come as we stand and sing.